start? Because I'm not sure, um, in terms of our audience, how familiar you are. Um, we're, we're, we're addressing here very large geographies, which are diverse. But we're also talking about, about 150 years of movement. Okay. Um, so when we're thinking about Mexico, and you'll have noticed this already as we listen to Steve and as John, um, and as we move into Mexico, it's um, really important to contextualize movement because um, migration, on the one hand, um, is characterized by this bewildering variability of individual experience, but then on the other, there are social processes that frame um, that, that mobility, right, and um, migrants' potential trajectories. Um, the social vocation from which uh, a journey is initially undertaken, and notice here the social, not just the geographic vocation, um, its timing, um, the social and political conditions which organize departures, arrivals, transits, and returns. Um, and what I find um, in my work on the migrations to Mexico, which is what I'm going to be addressing here today, um, um, is that mobility is experienced and narrated in very different ways by people coming from the same region um, who um, speak of conquest, of diaspora, of exile, of pilgrimage. Um, and what I try to do is follow um, both the mobility and the construction of migrant memory, how they speak of and remember the mobility, um, trying to find, you know, track its logic, but also make sense of the constraints that shape um, what's happening. Um, because part of what we've also heard in Steve and John's um, analysis of their um, specific national contexts is that um, migrants <coughs> arriving in particular national contexts face particular demands and opportunities. Um, and they circulate with different kinds of resources um, across changing political and economic terrain. Um, but the constraints and opportunities they face can't be reduced to these topographies of origin and perception. Okay. Um, so there's something about um, the way these communities are structured that has to do with the fact that movement is sustained, that um, people organize in, in the communities, but also um, communities are fractured by different um, forms of difference. Um, and communities produce narratives of the past and forms of, of um, memory practice, OK? Um, and um, in the case of Mexico, which is, as I will, I'll try to do um, a chronological uh, analysis of what happens with the, the, the Christians in this, um, in this mobile population circulating between the Eastern Mediterranean and what I will call Middle America. Um, because this is a, a definitely a Christian majority matter, a Christian minority space of, um, of migration. Um, in Mexico, about 80% of, of the community or of, um, of, the, of the mobile population is Maronite. Um, there is a significant uh, presence of Greek Orthodox and Melkite um, families as well, and a very small fraction of, um, of uh, Tunisia and Druze uh, Muslims. There's also a very large um, migration of Syrian uh, Jewish populations from both Helen, from Aleppo, and from Sham, from Damascus. But those create a different and parallel institutional landscape that doesn't interact with the rest of the migration. Um, in the bulk of migrant memory, as it becomes um, contextualized or narrated in, in community histories and other forms of, of uh, of text, um, some of the core tropes of the migration to Mexico that narrate or that try to tell the story of why people choose to move to begin with um, are very much um, Christian narratives. Um, some of them have to do with um, terrible Turks, with um, 
for portraying um, Ottoman government and the Ottoman state as a menace to its Christian populations. And a different set of narratives um, identify um, these Christians uh, as Phoenician, and uh, in, in their uh, Phoenician-ness um, as more, more likely or more, or more propense to both travel and commerce and, 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 and um, being merchants as, a, uh, as their trade. And um, as um, a numerous scholars like Akram Khader, but also Sarawati, have, um, have suggested before me, um, both of these are um, Christian narratives that either appeal to um, a Western Christendom's um, hospitality or construct um, Lebanese nationalisms as Phoenician. And it's important because they, they dominate all migrant memory in the Mexican context. Um, before I go on to the sort of the, the, the history of um, the consequences of this Mahjad being a Christian majority Mahjad, um, I want to stop for a moment and um, reflect on the importance of how um, movement is imagined. Um, because I will be um, focusing, in a sense, um, on um, the encounter of this mobile Arab population and the way in which they imagine the Latin American populations they come in contact with. Um, and in, in much of this story, um, that imagination um, reminds us of colonial histories. And um, and these popu the, the Middle Eastern populations tend to assign themselves the role of conquerors or colonizers in the story. Okay, um, but before um, I go into that, I want to think about um, the grammatical construction of the term mahja, um, which is this um, space into which people move when they leave their place of origin, because um, in Arabic the term mahja. Um, transforms, makes an action of traveling, hajara, into a space, a mahja. Um, so thinking in Arabic, it becomes possible to imagine movement itself as an inhabitable place. Okay? And I think this is really um, interesting and, and, and this sort of helps create a different analytic imagination to approach mobility at large. Because the term challenges and displaces more rigid taxonomies, which fix subjects into sedentary, transcendent, or settled conditions, um, infusing mobility with the orientation and the affect that other grammars reserve for settlement, um, but also making place and continuity portable, in a sense. Um, and the subjects who inhabit this movable place as it were, whom I will call Mahjaris, are not only the people who move, in my analysis, but their descendants, insofar as they continue to engage the Mahja, this movable place, as a social space, um, and to dwell at a crossroads or in transit, um, subject to multiple sovereignties. Um, these travelers engage in trans-regional projects that condition how subjects who fail to move are dismissed, in a sense, um, in this culture of, of movement. Mahajada, um, people will say, of relatives or neighbors, um, who are described in frustration by Mahajadis, um, as um, they suggest that these subjects are somehow lacking in perspective or anchored in a horizon that is narrow or a social imaginary that is too local. Um, in a sense a, a, a past, a parochial past, in contrast to the modern and cosmopolitan temporality of the Mahshavi, of the migrant. Um, and I would like to suggest that the term Mahjad um, allows us to act in a place other than the place of origin that is perhaps more difficult to imagine in a non-Arabophone universe. Um, 
because we have, uh, when we study migration, there's all, all sorts of issues about how to do it or what vocabulary um, we can use in order to um, analyze and, and, um, and narrate this phenomenon. And the term diaspora, um, which is modeled on Jewish and black Atlantic experiences, um, as numerous scholars have noted, is haunted by a specter of loss and forced displacement which might come to haunt us again when we think about um, Christian mobility today out of the Middle East in the context of war, um, but which is not necessarily, um, which does not necessarily best describe this 150 years of mobility that preceded. Mm -hmm. um, because it, the Mahjad, in a sense, affords exploration of movement in a positive key, um, which is neither um, this sense of diasporic loss or the rapacious extractive encounter of the colonial one. Because as I was saying, um, the, and what I'm trying to do here um, as well as reimagine um, or to uh, note ideologies of mobility, so ideas people have of thinking about why they're mobile and how they're mobile that inform their practice. Um, many or most of the scholarship on um, these uh, migrations towards the Americas has been um, ha has been um, sort of trapped in um, stories or histories of national reception. So nations are these containers, and people move from one to the other. And what I've tried to do is um, to to open those um, by focusing on the way Mahatas Mahjari speak about their mobility, and um, by thinking about how there are actually um, there's a tension between these national frames with um, the Ottoman moment of the migration. Um, this this the the Mahja, this floating world um, in Mexico is um, mostly Maronite. They dominate the early moment, um, and there's little differentiation. Uh, in terms of um, that, there's no um, uh, there's no question in terms of a, a fracture within the community along confessional lines or along um, other kinds of um, fractures. Um, when France is assigned um, the mandate over the um, Syrian Lebanon or the Mashrik, um as of 1919, 1920. Um, France becomes the authority governing them rather than the Ottoman state. And it is much easier for the Christians to negotiate protection and to establish a positive um, affiliation with mandate authorities than it is for um, migrants who are either um, Jewish, Muslim, or um, Greek Orthodox. The Maronites have a, a history of relationship to France that they cultivate. Um, and that they, they um, a foreground in this new context. Um, and that's particularly important because um, the, the transition from the Ottoman to the mandate um, administrations in the Mashlik, um completely alters the landscape of the Mahajak. It creates new possibilities of association. It interrupts um, certain alliances. It, um, it has important consequences um, in terms of the creation of um, trade blacklists and therefore of the, um, of the interruption of, of, uh, of merchant activity. Um, and um, there's additionally, in the Mexican context, um, a very strong link between, um, on the one hand, religious practice or identification and um, what I would call, or I would argue with, civilizational status, um, but also um, a particular racialization. And um, in the Mexican context, Christianity is a condition of whiteness, um, but Christianity is also a condition um, for developing this partnership that I've mentioned um, between the, the migrant elite and um, European descent Criollos, uh, European descent elites who are Mexican, um, and um, affording the migrants 
um, this sort of equivalent status as colonizers um, that's going to develop in the Mexican context. Um, um, and finally, in conclusion, um, Christians are also um, super represented or are um, the, the core um, authors in the production of memory in the Mexican Mahta um, as authors of national histories, community chronicles, memoirs, and cookbooks. Um, and yet, um, in uh, Mexican Orientalism, the non-Arab readings of these populations, uh, Christians are indistinguishable from uh, Muslims or Jews, um, and are, are exoticized um, in all kinds of Islamophile cultural production. So, um, in, in, in conclusion, um, the fact that this mahjar is so predominantly Christian has all kinds of consequences affording social mobility for um, that uh, Maronites within the migration in contrast to other populations. Um, and yet, uh, there's, there's this contradiction in the fact that um, uh, in contemporary cultural production, but also um, in, in, in this 150 years of Mexican Orientalisms, um, they're often conflated with uh, those parts of the migration which are not Christian. So before I begin, I also want to extend a huge thank you to Yvonne and Tamara for this um, incredible effort to put together this conversation and to Chidin for the logistics. That's also a huge help. Um, I'm a graduate student, so speaking up with this panel, I'm speaking with the people I've been reading and engaging with for the last three years and finally meeting. So it's a pleasure to meet you all, um, and I look forward to sharing my work. Um, the story that I want to tell you today is a story about two neighborhoods and the long distance and long term connections in between them. So the first neighborhood, I believe on your left, um, is Bay Jala, a town of about 11,000 people in the district of Bethlehem in Palestine. And on the right is the second town of Patronato, which is a little bit smaller, about 8,000 people, um, in Chile's capital city of Santiago. For more than a century, uh, these two neighborhoods have been trans-regionally connected through the migration of mostly Christian Arabs and the engagements of their descendants. Today, Chile is home to between 300 and 500,000 Chileans of Palestinian heritage, and the presence of Palestine and Chile can be felt in the cultural, political, economic, and religious spheres uh, throughout the country. When you walk the streets of Patronato, for instance, you can sense these lasting legacies. You can hear the ringing of church bells, the scents that emerge from local restaurants, and the sights of bright Palestinian flags hung in store windows. The research questions that emerge for me from this, you know, this kind of context is how do Chilean Palestinians engage using cultural, cultural and religious practices to establish a sense of belonging both in the Chilean context and in the neighborhood of Patanato, and simultaneously to a global Palestinian diaspora. Um, and maybe I should reconsider my use of diaspora after your talk, we can talk more about that. Um, but more broadly, how do these immigrants establish and maintain cultural connections with host communities and homelands that are often physically and symbolically distant? My research suggests that to answer these questions, we have to look at how these everyday embodied practices um, in, can pertain to experiences of longing and belonging. So my title was belonging, and I think that these two terms are very, uh, these two concepts are very intertwined, and I'm going to try to unpack that a little bit um, in, throughout the talk. So I'm going to start out by giving you a basic historical backdrop um, from about the 1880s to our current moment of these two neighborhoods, and then I'll move on to um, a little bit from my field work that I did in 2016 and 2018. Um, I like to use sensory ethnography, which is where you essentially pay more attention to the senses besides sight, sound, or besides sight, because it's, in general in the social sciences, we don't pay attention to smell and taste um, and other feelings. Uh, so I'm going to pass around some spices that you can smell during my talk. 
Um, if you have a sensitive nose, the, be careful with this one. This is Merken. It's a smoked ají pepper from Chile. And the other one is um, Zata, which you may be familiar with, which is a thyme-based herb mixture. So I'll pass these around, smell them, uh, experience the senses as I talk. Uh, I'll start here. Um, and these were both purchased in Batanado. So you know. So throughout this discussion, I really just want to provide a general scope of the connections between Chile and Palestine, while also highlighting the local, regional, and global nature of this connection. The neighborhood of Beit Jala is part of what's known as the Christian Triangle in Palestine. And you can see here Beit Jala, Bethlehem, and Beit Zahur are right next to each other. Um, and these neighboring towns are where the majority of Palestine's Christian population is located, and where the majority of the holy sites are as well. So Christians have had this long but declining presence in Palestine, particularly given the emigration that we've been discussing um, over this panel. Um, and some of the present-day families in Beit Jala have, for instance, over half of their extended families in Chile. In some cases, entire villages, entire you know, blocks have relocated to certain parts of the Americas, particularly in Chile as well. Now, the bulk of this emigration occurs as the Ottoman Empire collapses and begins to collapse in the early, or late 1800s and early 1900s. And a lot of the families that were living in Beit Jala they began to start fearing conscription and increased taxation, and so sent mostly younger men to find work and better opportunities elsewhere. Now, it wasn't necessarily an aimless travels, though. There was this history of international pilgrimage to these Christian holy sites, which became the foundations for the networks of these immigrations. Um, and the Christians that were leaving were generally well-educated and, and middle class, and so they had the ability to, to facilitate this emigration at a higher rate than, than their Muslim neighbors in the same towns. Thus, from about the 1880s to the 1930s, you see hundreds of Arab Christians from Bejala and neighboring towns leaving Balad Shem, their homeland, and heading to the Americas. The communities from Bejala crossed the seas in long journeys that had stops in Europe and North Africa, and then ended up on the shores of Brazil, Argentina, and throughout Central and North America. After finding large groups of Arab migrants from modern-day Lebanon and Syria already settled in Brazil and Argentina, these migrants headed west and crossed the Andes uh, to look for new markets to sell their goods. They were also eventually moved to smaller towns for the same reason, so out of cities. Um, they, once they were in Chile, most of these migrants then spread throughout the country using north-south railroad lines. Um, in order to get from the north of Chile to the south, I mean, it's really skinny, really long, um, you have to take these trains that have a, a, a port of embarkment in Santiago, in the region that's highlighted in red. So migrants coming from the north had to get off in Santiago and then go to the south to get on a different train. But what ends up happening is a lot of these migrants get off in Santiago and say, oh, we'll stay here. So you have these really high-dense uh, communities of Palestinians in towns like Valparaíso, Viña del Mar, Quillota, La Calera, and what I'll be talking about, Patronato. So it is said uh, from a couple of my interviewees and a, a couple of other authors have pointed this out, that this central region in Chile, Santiago, um, has a sense of nostalgia for Palestinians because the climate, the actual environment, is similar to in Beit Jala. So this produces kind of, there you go, that belonging and longing through this memory and um, both comfort for new, for new arrivals, but also a sense of, of longing for the homeland. So the young men that had left Bejala settled mostly um, in Pajonato and surrounding areas and began to work as door-to-door -door salesmen, selling anything from crosses, rosaries, and olive oil that they had brought um, to local products like produce, socks, and other textiles. Knowing little Spanish, they would get to customers' doors and ask them in Spanish, ¿Hay algo que le falte? Is there anything that you're missing? And this is how they get the nickname of falte. <laughs> I, it took me a while to learn that because I thought it was a word in Arabic and I couldn't find this. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's clearly... You know, yeah, we know what's falte. You know, falte zaka, they say. It's someone like, you know, he's just one and old. One uh, at own, you know, like... Sure. There's a, uh, there is a group of people, and this guy is a felpe. So he is someone distinguished by, you know, by something. Yeah. Like he is very well uh, appearing. He is very, very intelligent. This is felpe. This is excellent. I'd love to talk about if that came back from yeah. um, <laughs> Chile to, to, to Palestine. Um, so, yeah. so it's also interesting because these initial migrants in Santiago didn't actually have the desire to stay long term. 
Um, many of them planned on returning, and this is, a, I think, a similar case in, in a lot of what we've heard, and, but ended up staying, you know, ended up settling for food. Um, the stories of early economic success soon reached the families that had stayed back in Beijala, and this prompted additional family reunification. Um, and collectively, the Arab Christians were really good at establishing networks that would help bring family members and neighbors to the Americas. So even in this early stage, you have these very intimate connections between Batonato and Beijala that are constant. Several factors like endogamous marriage and local newspapers, uh, as Stephen mentioned, were central to um, keeping this diaspora, this Arab diaspora, strong throughout Chile and, and, and connected to the rest of Latin America. So uh, a lot of these migrants in Patronato were well aware of what was happening back home, so news would travel both ways. And a good example of this is when the British mandate begins, um, the frustrations from that reverberate throughout Latin America. The British begin to impose policies that exclude Arab communities from new Palestinian citizenship, and this is when you have local religious leaders in Patronato voicing the Palestinian cause in the diaspora. And this is particularly interesting because it's a, it's a Palestinian cause now. It's not a, a strictly an Arab cause. And so this is start where you start to see part of that national uh, identification. This is um, central to the work of Nadim Bawal. So if, you know, I'll put up some sources later, but you should check that out if that's what interests you. During the early arrival, a lot of the Arabs in Chile experienced a form of anti-immigrant sentiment that other European immigrants in Chile did not. Um, Chileans use very orientalist and often Islamophobic stereotypes when commenting on um, the community's practices and their event, you know, their economic success in the country. So, this was known as Turcophobia, literally the fear of Turks, and this is based upon the fact that initial arri arrivals came with Ottoman passports or Turkish passports, and so they get this nickname of Turco. Um, and we see this example uh, from a Chilean reporter. Uh, from a famous newspaper, a Santiago-based newspaper, in, the, in, in 1911, um, this comes from the work of Antonio Hernandez, which, uh, you know, you can see if you've had a chance to read it, that there's these very oriental stereotypes about um, being dirty, about the you know, mysterious plagues, and so you have this kind of transfer of oriental sentiment to Chile as a way of kind of coupling with anti-immigrant sentiment. So amidst these pressures, a new generation of now Palestinian Chileans was born and were encouraged to obtain degrees in law, medicine, engineering, and they began to start in, inhabiting important social positions in Chilean society. Um, for instance, Juan Yero Lolas uh, played an essential role in the development of Chile's banking industry um, and the textiles. And actually the first thing that Pinochet did when he came uh, to power was to give the nationalized textile industries back to Juan Yero Lolas. So um, interesting history there as well. So this economic success helped to mitigate um, and reproduce some of the stereotypes that I mentioned in the former slide. Um, and throughout much of this 20th century period, the Palestinians in Padronato stayed connected to what was happening in the Palestinian homeland. So news about the Nakba, about 1948, um, and the 67 war promoted a number of Chilean Palestinian organizations um, to mobilize for Palestine. And these were religious organizations, these were the Klu Arabes, the Arab clubs, the Palestinian clubs, that emerged in Santiago. And they would send letters, they would um, do fundraisers, they, they were really involved in what was happening in Palestine throughout the 20th century. There's a saying in Chile that in every town there's a priest, a politician, and a Palestinian. <laughs> Sometimes they're all the same. Um, this is partially because of the ongoing cultural, political, and religious connections between neighborhoods like Patronato and Bechala. And today we see these ongoing connections, um, for instance, in the protests that filled the streets of Santiago in 2014. So in 2014, um, one of many Gaza wars began between Israel and Gaza, and um, Palestinian Chileans and other Chileans went to the streets in Santiago and essentially pressured the government to stop all its trade with Israel. And I don't think that Chile's trade with Israel was huge impact, but it was a political, a political sim, you know, a sim, symbolism. Um, you can see here, for instance, this mural on the bridge that crosses the Mapocho River going into Patronato, a mural that says, La resistencia continua, viva Palestina libre, 67 años de, la, de Nakba. And this is, you know, the resistance continues, live, uh, viva Palestina, um, uh, 67 years of, of Nakba, since Nakba. So you see this visible, this very public uh, demonstration of Palestinian political identity in, in, in Patronato. Um, there are some, also some sports clubs in Chile that have connections to Palestine. This is 
uh, Pueblo Palestino. Uh, as you can see, this jersey was actually not, there's a long story, but it, they, they can't wear this jersey because it's the entire map um, of, of Palestine. Uh, so there's another uh, interesting history. Um, there's also an interesting group called Operación Retorno, which is a NGO that attempts to fly Chilean Palestinians to Palestine and to take them on tours of Beit Jala and Bethlehem. I want to try to get on one of these and see what this kind of touristy but also reconnection with the homeland looks like. Um, so in the 21st century context, there are there's one really good example. I, I study mostly food, and I'll, I'll get into the religious part of this in a second. But there are restaurants, grocery stores, bakeries that sell Arab cuisine um, and ingredients throughout Patronato and the rest of Chile. Um, this example of Fufu Bakery is pretty interesting. There's one branch in Patronato and another branch in, pa in Beit Jala, and they're owned by brothers. And so um, the brother in Chile moved to Chile in the early 2000s, married a Chilean Palestinian woman, and they run this bakery. And it was the first time I had found in Chile um, uh, canafe, which is a dish that, you know, it's a dessert that you don't really get outside of, uh, uh, in Chile, much at all. Um, so the owner of this restaurant, Eduardo, told me that a, uh, when, when I asked him about what, the rest, what it means to have this restaurant in Chile, he said, Aquí hay un mundo aparte. Para los palestinos, Chile es su país. Palestina está aquí en Chile. Es como una segunda parte de Palestina. And in English, this translates to the quote above. Here there is a world apart. For Palestinians, Chile is their country. Palestine is here in Chile, it's like the second part of Palestine. And this is the second part of where my title comes from. So another key social institution for Chilean Palestinians is the St. George Cathedral in Patronato. Founded in 1917, this church has been home to the Greek Orthodox community since its foundation. Um, and many priests that have, uh, have worked in it are, are most, are, have been from Beit Jala itself. Uh, one statistic from a an edited volume by Mitri Rahev um, says that the, of the initial Christian migrants to Padronato, about 70% were Greek Orthodox, while 30% were Roman Catholic. With the second generation, though, the Arab Christians born in Chile, this statistic flips. So you start to have, see about 70% of them being Roman Catholic and 30% um, being, being Greek Orthodox. And in some cases, marriages to Catholic Chileans and practices like Catholic baptisms or partially attempts to integrate into Chilean society. And so you see some of that visible here. While there's been this kind of general move towards Catholicism, the Greek Orthodox Church in Patronato and the communities around it have continued to play a substantial role in the lives of the younger generations. Um, some of the second through fifth generation Palestinians that I spoke with remembered fondly eating mamoud, a sweet uh, cracker-based pastry, uh, on, on Holy Week before Easter, or going to Mass as kids and hearing um, sermons in Arabic, um, being in that, in that space. Um, some even mentioned carrying uh, biblical texts in Arabic that, that had been passed down to them from, by their parents and grandparents. And so there is this kind of reconnection with the Greek Orthodox uh, Church in Padronato, even though in most instances um, these younger generations don't attend regularly, or they've become more secular, or they've moved away. So there is a kind of cultural um, dynamic to the church, and particularly because Papanato is such a small neighborhood. So an example of where food and religion come together um, it, it is in this in funeral traditions. So Camila, a third generation Chilean Palestinian, described the ways that the community unites around the Orthodox Church in Patronato, particularly during funerals. A funeral is a big deal. When somebody well known in the community dies, there can be two or three hundred people that come to attend the service. The weeks of the service, um, the week of the service, the family of the deceased will cook fat uh, for all of the guests. It's essentially goat meat and yogurt prepared with rice. So Camila describes this and other important traditions around the funeral too. For example, um, guests will gather and drink black coffee um, without sugar. Um, and then they'll go to the service, and afterwards they'll drink black coffee again, this time with sugar, kind of a symbolic sweetness in the passing. Um, this is a custom that Camila attributes back to Arab traditions before, long before um, Palestinians had migrated to Chile. Um, and she also mentions that sometimes the families will rejoin about 40 days after the service to once again commemorate um, the passing of a loved one. So this, this cathedral, the St. George Cathedral in Patronato, is the oldest of the five Orthodox cathedrals, or the Orthodox churches in Santiago, and is definitely the best known. 
That said, these churches all started from donations from wealthier Chilean Palestinians, and there's some interesting class differences between them. So the one in Padronato is in more of a working class neighborhood, um, and some wealthier Chilean Palestinians do not like to associate with it, so they move to other uh, larger churches in the region. I can talk uh, a little bit more about this later if it's of interest. So while there's kind of this variety in how strictly religious practices are followed by different individuals, the church continues to play, to be a meeting space for different generations. People come from all over and stay after the services for coffee to describe and discuss what's going on in Palestine. Um, some participants even mention uh, large attendance during specific events, like for instance during the, pas the passing of Yasser Arafat, there was a sermon uh, uh, you know, there. So to wrap up, I want to brief briefly reflect on the connections between these neighborhoods of Beit Jala and Padronato and discuss, moving forward, the palestinian chilean connection. Um, in the last five years, Padronato has become home to hundreds of Haitian, Peruvian, and Syrian migrants who are currently in the positions that Arab migrants were in about 100 years ago. Um, additionally, in the last week, Chile has erupted into protests that initially started up with a spike in metro transit prices, but has now become about the general hardships that the Chileans have faced uh, during the last 30 years of, of neoliberal rule in Chile. Um, my, some informants and my brother, who's currently there, sent me these pictures from Santiago um, over the last week. Um, so in conclusion, this initial, uh, the initial Arab Christians that made their way from Bejala to Patronato experienced a sense of both longing for the homeland that was entangled with their experiences of belonging once they arrived in the diaspora. In similar but unique ways, the subsequent generations have often re-engaged with Palestinian identity that has been passed down to them and which is often embodied in these religious and culinary practices um, that they do on a daily basis. It's an embodied experience. This community has also overall established a sense of belonging within the diaspora while staying connected to the homeland. Um, in short, returning to what Eduardo mentioned early on, Chile has become la segunda parte de Palestina. Thank you. Thank you.